I'd like to welcome you all to today's grand rounds on updates in the approach to patients with diabetes. We're thrilled to have with us today, Dr. Reshmi Srinath. She's an assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Bone Disease Uptown. And she's the director of the Mount Sinai Weight and M Metabolism Management Program. Her interest in that started uh, in college when she was a division one tennis player. And that's what led her to pursue a career in medicine and to specialize in endocrinology. She trained at uh, University of Connecticut School of Medicine, did her medicine residency at Duke and her fellowship training at Johns Hopkins, uh, and then has been faculty here at Mount Sinai and where her expertise is in the prevention and treatment of obesity, diabetes, and other metabolic complications, and where she also serves um, as the director of the Mount Sinai Weight and Metabolism Management Program. And we are delighted to welcome Dr. Srinath. Well, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me OK. Um, so today, um, obviously, this is an exciting topic. I could speak for a while. Um, but first of all, disclosure is none. Um, you know, topics I'd like to highlight today in terms of objectives, one, to briefly review epidemiology, prevalence, and some of the trends recently observed in patients with obesity. Um, and then really the majority of today's talk really to focus on screening diagnosis of patients who are presenting to your office, um, reviewing the role of management, first focusing on diet lifestyle management, and then looking at the role of weight loss pharmacotherapy and particularly bariatric surgery in obesity management. Before we go there, um, I first like to start with a case. This is a patient probably sounds very familiar to you. So this is a 48 year old male who showed up to me for follow up for longstanding type two diabetes, which had been diagnosed over 10, 15 years ago. And the theme of our visit, this was just recently was really frustration. Um, the coronavirus pandemic had been going on. He had been working remotely. There was frustration with weight, frustration with glucose control and trying to allay some of those concerns. Um, just to round out his history, um, in terms of past medical history, he does have a past medical history of, in addition to type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, and obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, there is strong history of type 2 diabetes in multiple relatives, as well as heart disease in his father. Um, he is a non-smoker with occasional alcohol. Um, in terms of medications, he is on basal insulin with Lantus 20 units at bedtime. He is on max metformin, 2,000 milligrams daily, Trulicity every week, 1.5. And we had just recently added Humalog uh, with dinner, 10 units. Um, and these are the vitals that are presented to you. He is five foot 10 inches. He has a weight of 260 pounds, which nicely you've noted that he has lost from previously being 270 pounds. Um, but this puts him a BMI of 37.3. Um, his blood sugar on finger stick in the office is 178. This is uh, fasting and his A1C point of care is 7.9% that day. Um, and so the question posed to me and, and really his concerns are, how do, we, how do we get this better? How do we improve his care? Um, and in terms of options here, I've mentioned option A, start an exercise program with at least 30 minutes daily of uh, incorporating cardio and resistance training. B, um, switch his weekly Trulicity, which is a GLP-1 agonist, to weekly Ozempic, um, also known as semaglutide, um, to see if that might help him. Um, C, refer to bariatric surgery to discuss potential benefit of weight loss surgery and maybe diabetes remission. Or D, um, add glipizide, which is a sulfonylurea, to see if that might improve his prandial glucose levels. Um, so obviously there are very different ways to approach this. And my hope is by the end of today, we can sort of highlight some of these thoughts and what might be appropriate here. So first, um, just going back in terms of defining obesity. So what is obesity? Just generally, we think of it as carrying excess weight. Um, we typically use body mass index. This is measured as weight in kilograms over height in meters squared. Um, and typically we consider BMI over 30 as considered to have obesity. Um, however, we know that BMI is not a perfect marker. It's not a perfect assay of a patient's weight. We know that in someone who's very muscular, it's gonna overestimate their total body fat. And in someone who's you know, lost muscle mass, it's really gonna underestimate their body fat. So really not, not a perfect marker and something we're still grappling with. Um, but we can use BMI as a starting point. And we know that Characterizing patients with BMI over 25 to 29.9 is considered overweight. 
when their BMI is over 30, as I mentioned earlier, we consider that class one obesity. Um, subsequently, 35 and higher class two and, and 40 and higher is considered class three. When you subsequently add in waist circumference, we find that waist circumference is a good marker for risk of cardiometabolic health. Um, and when you have a patient presenting to you with not only obesity, but also having a waist circumference more than 40 inches in a male or more than 35 inches in a female, we know that puts that patient at particular cardiometabolic risk. Um, and so that's why, you know, with my patients, I really try to get both BMI and waist circumference measurements. Then we think about definition. So again, how do we gain the weight? We really know that weight gain results from a constant net positive balance between energy and output. Um, we think of our energy intake is food, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, as well as alcohol. And then we consider our output is our expenditure. That includes physical exercise, thermogenesis, and basal metabolism. Um, how do we further characterize this? So just to go into this more in detail. So again, total energy expenditure is de defined as above. Um, to further define resting energy expenditure, that does include the energy involved in maintaining body temperature as well as you know, function of your organ systems. And I call this also our basal metabolism or basal metabolic rate. Um, What's very important to know is that lean body mass is the prime determinant of your resting energy expenditure. Um, and this is a concept I really own in on in my with my patients because I say, if you can build some muscle tone and improve your lean body mass, we can definitely, that will boost your metabolism and that could potentially help with you with weight loss. Um, to further characterize thermogenesis, there's this our thermic response to food. So yes, possibly eating more spicier, hotter foods could help you boost more calories and, and potentially help weight loss. Um, and that de deserves more, more research. Um, going to sort of what are the players and what are the key players that drive weight, weight management. So we know at the level of the adipose tissue, there are adipokines such as leptin and others that are metabolically active. The pancreas is very hormonally active, both as an exocrine, endocrine organ. Um, at the level of the GI tract, we've got ghrelin, our hunger hormone. We've got GLP-1, CCK, multiple you know, hormones and, and peptides that are affecting our appetite. And then not to say the least, you know, our hypothalamus is driving our appetite. And we know that the level of the arcuate nuclei, there are multiple neuropeptides, which not only do they drive our appetite, they also make it harder when we're trying to lose the weight, um, they sort of fight us a bit. So again, something to focus in on. At the patient's level, we know that there are many factors that affect a patient's weight. It's not just the individual and their metabolism, it's also eating behaviors. It is uh, the environment, what's around them, what food is around them. It is economic factors. Um, and this obviously could be a discussion in itself. Um, and lastly, social cultural factors around eating and, and, and families. Um, and, and the reason we care is, you know, there is a growing obesity pandemic. And we know this is particularly relevant in the setting of coronavirus. Um, and so this was actually just data released uh, in the last month by the CDC showing self-reported prevalence of obesity. And what's of major concern is the states highlighted in red. There are now over actually 12 states here highlighted in red, which have a prevalence of obesity of over 35%. Um, that is quite significant. And that's actually a rise from a year ago where there were only nine states having a prevalence of obesity more than 35%. So again, noting uh, the red states have prevalence of obesity over 35%. The states highlighted in orange have a prevalence over 30% and the states highlighted in yellow have a prevalence over 25% and that does include New York. Um, we have the lone state of Colorado which has a prevalence over 20%. So again, a growing epidemic that we need to further address and, and emphasize. So which is why starting, you know, back 1998, um, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute um, further tried to assess and characterize obesity and drive management. They created a framework. Uh, this was further substantiated in 2013 by the American Heart Association, uh, American College of Cardiology and the Obesity Society. And I've purposely made this small, um, so it's hard to follow, but basically it starts with BMI on the left and then you're sort of tracking along these blocks um, to figure out how to manage a patient. Um, and it was quite, quite complicated, I will say, and hard to follow. Uh, we are now moving towards an approach where rather just looking at BMI, 
we're also looking at complications. And so this approach is more of what we call a complication centric approach, really looking at the patient, not just in what their BMI is, what their current health status is, but what are their ongoing health issues? How are they being managed? And how does that affect the severity of how you're gonna address and intervene on their weight? Um, and so what this does, and I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger, um, is that patients first are characterized by BMI. And I'm not sure if my pointer can be seen here, but, um, First characterized by BMI, if they have a BMI over uh, 25 to 29, they're considered overweight. If they have a BMI over 30, they're considered obese, to have obesity. And then we look at their complications. Do they have diabetes? Do they have heart disease? Do they have high blood pressure, cholesterol, PCOS, infertility? If they have mild to moderate complications, they're considered stage one. If they have one or more severe complications, that includes diabetes, heart disease, they're considered stage two. That then triages how you approach them. And we look at that. So patients who have stage two or stage, excuse me, stage one or stage two um, in that category, they would qualify for more aggressive pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery versus someone who is stage zero with no complications. This is someone where you're really going to own in on diet lifestyle modification. So this, again, is an approach that we're taking to try to move towards addressing obesity um, in a more holistic sort of generalized approach. Um, and the other point I want to make just in general in terms of obesity is that not only do we want to look at patients with obesity just, you know, as a diagnosis, but we also want to know that we want to move away from the stigma associated with obesity and understand that it is a chronic disease. And so in 2016, um, ACE, our American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, created this uh, term adiposity-based chronic disease. Again, where the focus is looking at what is the amount of a patient's adiposity, what is the distribution, and how can we further characterize that and look at the degree of complications. So again, again, pushing away from the stigma associated with obesity and moving towards how do we intervene and how do we we manage it. So next, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can manage, you know, when a patient shows up in your office. Um, so this is information that I get. Patients comes to me. The first question that I want to know is why are they here? What brings them? What are, why do they want to lose weight? What is the motivation? And that may be for the sake of their wife. That could be because they're they're feeling hopeless, which is something that's been mentioned to me with the coronavirus pandemic. It can be for many reasons. Um, I then get into a little bit of the nitty gritties. What is their current weight? What, what is their maximum weight they've ever been? Is this the highest they've been in their adult life? Um, what has been the trajectory in the last few years and the last 10, 20 years? Um, and what is their goal? Where would they like to be where they would feel healthy? Um, in terms of prior attempts, we wanna know what has worked for them. Have they tried certain diets? Have they worked with a physician before? Or have they done this independently on their own? Um, and next, sort of looking at, you know, if they have used, used pharmacotherapy, which drugs did they consider? Which drugs did they use? How did they respond to those drugs? And which caused adverse effects? Um, typically, what I do ask patients is to provide me a 24-hour diet recall, where I typically just ask them, what did you eat yesterday, including everything, including drinks as well, um, and also just to get a sense of their general schedule. When are they eating? What is their typically day, day like? Are they working remotely, sitting on their, on their chair all day? Are they up and about all day long at work? Um, and lastly, just looking at some of the social, uh, excuse me, looking at their activity level also, you know, are they exercising? Are they creating some structured activity throughout their week? Um, and then addressing psychological environmental factors. Who is in the house? Who is doing the cooking? Who is visiting? These all can affect um, how we manage our weight because I've had patients come to me and say, I eat really great, but I keep ice cream in the house for my grandkids. And you know, when they come visit, which lately hasn't been often, um, I end up eating all, all the ice cream I bought. So there are multiple factors that characterize and, and affect patients and how they manage their health. Um, and lastly, but not least, looking at their comorbidities and how those are managed. In terms of our physical examination, um, I am getting, a, as I mentioned earlier, a body mass index as well as a waist circumference. Um, and this is just a pictorial representation just to remind us how to measure body, excuse me, waist circumference. So we know that we take it at the top of the iliac crest and we measure the maximum diameter around the waist. And so there's some variations on that, but essentially it's uh, generally taken at the top of the iliac crest and it helps, as we mentioned, just in terms of measuring cardiometabolic health. The other thing I look at is waist, waist distribution. So is this someone who has mostly central adiposity or is their weight sort of generally well distributed? Because that affects how you're going to manage them as well. 
In terms of our labs or medical assessments, um, I am screening for secondary causes, complications, so I'm always getting fasting or random glucose, as well as an A1C. Um, we are screening them for NAFLD with a fasting lipid panel, excuse me, fasting liver enzyme panel. Um, we're looking at cardiovascular risk factors, measuring their blood pressure, looking at their cholesterol levels. Um, and in all patients, I'm checking a screening TSH to look and see if thyroid levels are at all contributing to your weight. And if they are already on thyroid hormone, how can we optimize their thyroid hormone management to get their levels to be improved? Um, and I'm also asking patients about sleep. We know that sleep apnea plays a huge role in weight, metabolism, and can impact patients' quality of life. So that is a question then, um, that I always ask patients and, and consider sleep referral if indicated. We then use that information to triage patients and see how they can progress. And so the first step is diet lifestyle modification. We then move to pharmacotherapy and then to bariatric procedures as indicated. Um, and so again, getting to sort of the basics, we know that weight loss, you know, we think about it, it's calorie in, calorie out. It create, you have to create a net negative balance to lose the weight. Um, and so when I think about nutrition, I don't really necessarily like the word diet, um, but I tell patients there, these are creating sustainable habits that you can maintain um, and it does require a deficit. So if we are to say healthy weight loss is one to two pounds a week, you need to limit your calorie intake to 500 to 750 uh, by, excuse me, by 500 to 750 calories per day. Um, for most females, that requires a daily caloric intake of 1,200 to 1,500. That's net, you know, not including exercise. Um, for men, that's between 1,500 and 2,000 calories per day. Um, there are many diets available, and I probably could spend another hour talking about the diets that are out there and the clinical data we have. Um, but what I generally can characterize them as we have the very low calorie diets that are less than 800 calories a day. These are typically what you would call your meal replacements um, or your very high protein uh, diets or we have the low calorie diets. And these are all between 1,000 to 1,500 calories. And you can have a low fat, such as a, a Ornish diet or a Learn diet. You can have a low carb, high protein diet. Um, that includes Atkins zone. Um, you can have a low glycemic index. You have, excuse me, low glycemic index diet. We have the Mediterranean diet and we have intermittent fasting. And you know, when patients always ask me, what's the best one? And they always raise question of whether keto or low carb is the best. Um, and what I do emphasize is I'm not a huge keto fan, but I do say that in the short term, it can help if you're really tied to it and you wanna do it and you, and you feel like you can maintain it. So uh, when I mentioned low carb, I just wanna sort of highlight some of the studies that have been done. So in the early 2000s, there were some really you know, nice papers that were presented. These were short term studies up to a year, which compared a low carb Atkins type diet to the LEARN diet, the Ornish diet, some of the other variations of, 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 of diets. And they found that possibly low carb might be the most effective. Uh, Follow-up studies, including a very nice study in the New England Journal in 2008, showed that really compliance was the biggest factor. And so over a year or longer, um, those who were able to maintain whatever diet they were on really lost the most significant weight. Um, more recently, there's really been interest in low carb. So in 2008, Dr. Westman, who I had actually got to work with, he showed a ketogenic diet where less than 20 grams of carb intake actually provided safe and, and it, was, it was effective for glucose control in patients who had type two diabetes who were trying to lose weight. Um, and I will mention that even in the setting of diabetes, um, Verta Health, um, it actually is a remote digital platform. They are now looking at low carb or keto as a possible um, uh, intervention for treating patients with type two diabetes uh, and with the idea that they can reverse diabetes with nutri nutritional ketosis. So I will say that we've gone a long way in terms of addressing low carb, but I think there's still interest and I think that we can, we can use it if we want to, but I, I think the most important thing is sustainability. Um, more recently, I've gotten a lot of interest in intermittent fasting and um, just to sort of remind us what that includes. So intermittent fasting doesn't change what you eat, it's more when you eat. Um, and there's multiple variations on that. Um, many of us may be familiar with time-restricted feeding. This is called the 16 and eight plan. Um, so this includes eating in an eight hour window. That eight hour window can be anything of your choice. So what I tell patients is you can eat from 10 to six, 11 to seven, 12 to eight. Um, but I prefer that when that eight hour window is over, kitchen closed, dinner's over, there's no more food intake. You must distract and, or do something else. 
Um, and I found that to be quite useful because we know that a lot of the late night eating occurs after dinner. Um, and we know that by incorporating that sort of recommendation, patients are able to divert and they're able to manage their time a little bit better. Um, but it does involve a little bit of fasting earlier in the morning because they're not eating much throughout the first few hours of the morning. Um, there's also the five and two plan, which is basically five days of regular eating, which were called fasting days and two days of, um, excuse me, five days of feasting, uh, which is basically just eating regularly. And then there are two days of fasting where you're taking in less than 800 calories a day. Um, and this is hard to do. I think one of the challenges that I found is patients always ask me, what are the two days that I should do it? Um, should it be on the weekend? Should it be on the weekdays? And essentially they say the week is so hectic with work and school that I'd rather do it on the weekend, but then it comes to the weekend and they're they're tired and they're, they want to relax and they want to eat. And so I found a few challenges with incorporating this. Um, the other form of this is the alternate day fasting. So patients are alternating between a feasting day and a fasting day every other day. And I will say it's quite challenging to manage. Um, I personally like the time restricted feeding uh, approach and that's something that I do emphasize with my patients. Um, we have now controlled studies using intermittent fasting that have developed over the last few years have been a lot of research interest. And this was actually a paper published a few years ago on um, JAMA uh, Network just showing the effects and benefits of intermittent fasting in the setting of diabetes. And so they did a, um, a randomized um, controlled study looking at patients with type 2 diabetes and comparing intermittent fasting, which included um, time-restricted eating, um, as well as the five and two plan to patients who were doing caloric restriction. And ultimately what they found is that over a year, there was no significant change in hemoglobin A1C level in terms of weight, um, in terms of fat mass or fat-free mass. Um, so ultimately what this tells me is that intermittent fasting may not be a superior choice in terms of an eating pattern or eating plan, um, but it's equivalent or possibly just another tool in your toolbox uh, when patients are coming to you wanting to lose weight, wanting to find another approach to calorie restrict. Um, and intermittent fasting creates structure around their day so that they can do calorie restriction in a safe and uh, closely monitored way. Um, some of the tips that I do tell my patients, I do typically recommend starting, at least with some charting, just so I can get a sense of what they're taking in, what are their nutrients, and many times I have them start with my fitness pal or I really like lose it, um, and they usually send me a log for about 24 or 48 hours so I can get a sense of what their calorie need, caloric needs are. Um, I think part of counseling patients on eating habits is really empowering them to learn nutrition labels, understand serving sizes. And I'm very hands, <laughs> I use my hands a lot. So I sort of tell them, you know, one to two fifths of rice per meal, you know, a slice of bread. Um, and so meet the size of your palm. I'm sort of using these even in my virtual visits to explain to patients, this is really how much you need to limit your rice or your, your carb intake. Um, and definitely I am utilizing a nutritionist um, actually for follow-up. So I have patients see me, I have them see our nutritionist every month for sort of monitoring between my visits. Um, and I try to see patients every two, two to three months, it's usually two months, just to check in and see how they're progressing because we know that frequency affects um, compliance and motivation as well. Obviously, any diet or nutritional approach should be used in conjunction with exercise and lifestyle modification. Um, I do try to recommend, you know, our current, uh, you know, suggestions of at least 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, for many, walking is enough. Um, and even if a patient can't walk, I'm suggesting doing stretching or some form of exercise on a bed or in a chair, whether it be kicking, moving their arms, something is good enough. Um, and what I also emphasize is trying to incorporate, as I uh, mentioned earlier, about the role of resistance training or toning. So whether that be yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, bands, dumbbells, kettlebells, any of that sort, um, that can help you um, not only burn calories, but also boost muscle mass and, and long-term cardiovascular health. Um, so I do really emphasize that as well. Um, this is just something I found off the internet, but it's something, again, a lot of demos that I do in my visits, just showing them get some bands and start moving your arms to the side, up and down. These are things that you can do um, just for 10, 20 minutes a day for a few days to help boost muscle tone. Um, and not to forget, um, you know, when I talk about diet lifestyle modification, there's a lot of behavior modification that has to take place. So we are asking patients to monitor their calorie needs, their exercise. Um, we're setting goals. So by seeing patients more frequently, we're setting frequent goals, having them stay accountable to those goals. Um, 
part of weight management is also looking at stressors, you know, what's going on in their life, how can we manage or reduce those stressors, um, or, and what are the stimuli as to why are we potentially craving or, or wanting food intake, and how can we reduce that stimulus. Um, I am considering pharma, excuse me, a psychotherapy when indicated, so um, there are therapists, obviously, that can help with eat disordered eating, um, and the most important thing, obviously, is, is social support. So patients need to have someone that they can talk to, someone who's supporting them in their weight loss journey. Um, I have found good effects from using programs like Weight Watchers, um, and I could talk a lot about Noom. Um, I found that Noom can be effective in terms of helping patients um, keep on track and really behaviorally help them make better eating choices. Um, and at least the short-term data from Noom looks quite good. So I will say that I have used those programs with success um, and patients find them helpful to help guide them. When a uh, diet lifestyle doesn't work or fails, um, that's when we consider pharmacotherapy. Um, and just to quickly summarize the indications. So Current FDA-approved weight loss pharmacotherapeutic agents are indicated when patients have a BMI over 30 or when their BMI is over 27 uh, with complications. That does include diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, unfortunately, um, and sleep apnea. Um, unfortunately, conditions such as infertility or PCOS are not potential uh, comorbidities that qualify, uh, which is something that's frustrating on my side, um, but it has to be having complications and having failed at least six months of diet lifestyle modification. Um, with any pharmacotherapeutic agent, um, we generally estimate a goal weight loss, 5%, 5 to 10% at three months. Um, and this is ideally done with a multidisciplinary team. So I'm working with a nurse, a nutritionist, and it's possible behavioral therapist if they need it. Um, and I'm following them very closely. If I start an agent, I'm seeing them within six weeks to make sure they're taking it, monitoring their progress, seeing if they're having adverse side effects, uh, and also looking for, you know, what is their response? Because we do note that the most significant response with any pharmacotherapeutic agent happens within the first six weeks. Um, before we even talk about agents, um, I can't forget to mention that we also should look at the chronic uh, pharmacotherapy patients are taking to see what else can be optimized. So for example, if they have depression or psychiatric diagnoses, we wanna see how can we either use weight neutral medications or use the lowest dose indicated if they're on a particular drug that we know is associated with weight loss. Um, in the setting of autoimmune conditions, I do counsel my patients to, if they can, use the lowest dose of steroid possible. You know, really, if they need the steroid injections or, or the, um, uh, for, for joint issues, you know, getting them, if it's gonna help them with their overall health. Um, but again, focusing on that. And, and also in the setting of diabetes, I really, focus my management on optimizing the use of GLP-1 agonists, including Trulicigo, Zempic, Victosa, as well as SGLT2 inhibitors, um, which can really boost weight loss and help optimize their diabetes control. Um, so this is just a brief list of current pharmacotherapeutic agents. Um, um, so where we have now four single agents on the market. Um, and I'm gonna talk about these in more detail. So we've got Orlistat, um, which was approved a few years, uh, excuse me, um, in 1999, which is a pancreatic lipase inhibitor. We've got Phentermine, which is an amphetamine derivative. Probably many of you are familiar with that previously known as Fenfen when it was combined with excuse me, Fenfluramine. We have Lorcaserin, uh, also known as Belvik. Uh, I've crossed this out because it was recently taken off the market, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, we've got Liraglutide, also known as Sexenda, uh, which is a GLP-1 agonist. Uh, and we have Plenity, uh, which was just approved recently, um, which we'll talk about. Um, and then we've got our two combination agents. We have Qsimia, which is fentramine and topiramate, which works synergistically both as a norepinephrine and GABA modulation. And then we have Contrave. Um, so just to talk briefly about all of these. So Orlistat was one of our oldest drugs, first approved in 1999. It works by inhibiting fat absorption. Um, many of you may be familiar with Ally, the over-the-counter formulation, which is 60 milligrams. Um, I have many patients who have tried this, and typically what we do is if they are interested, we use the drug, uh, excuse me, the, the prescribed drug, which is 120 milligrams, taken three times a day with food. Um, and most commonly, um, side effects are quite significant. People do describe a lot of flatulence, a lot of diarrhea. Um, very rarely, um, I've seen malabsorption of fat-soluble vitamins, and um, I've read about rare liver injury. I've never seen it before. Um, but what I would consider Orlistat is, is it's a very mild weight loss agent. This is something for patients who 
want a medicine that has a relatively safe side effect profile that can help them with weight loss and may not interfere with other uh, pharmacotherapy agents that they're taking. So again, Oralistat is something that I have used. Um, it's not my first line, but it's something that can be effective as one of our older agents. Um, this was just a study from 2004, Diabetes Care, showing that um, over 208 weeks, Oralistat plus lifestyle modification was associated with weight loss uh, approximately six to nine kilograms, which is considered significant. Um, so again, mild, a mild agent. Um, but I want to also move towards this fentramine. So fentramine is actually our oldest agent. I should recharacterize that. It was approved in 1959. It is an amphetamine derivative. Um, and the dosing typically was starting at 15 milligrams and you can move up to 30 or 37.5. Um, there is now an eight milligram formulation on the market, also known as Lomira, um, that is available and quite effective. And what I'll also mention is that they 30 milligram and the 37.5 milligram actually are the same dose. There is the same exact physical quantity of fentramine in both prescriptions. Um, so something to mention. Um, unfortunately, the issue with fentramine is we don't have long-term data. Um, many of the studies really had a high dropout rate. We can't really characterize the results, um, but we know that fentramine is a stimulant. It helps patients lose weight, it boosts their metabolism, um, potentially can also contribute to high heart rate, increased blood pressure, insomnia, dry mouth. Um, for sure, in someone who has uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled heart disease, this is something I'm not using. Um, but if it's controlled and they are safe, they get approval from their cardiologist, I have considered it for some. Um, I typically use fentramine short term. So generally, our current guidelines recommend using fentramine for three months and then reassessing, taking a break, um, and considering if they really need something long-term, considering something else long-term. Um, but I don't use it on its own um, for, for many reasons. Um, and it is cheap, so that's another potential benefit for it. Um, next, I want to mention Lorcaster and Belvique. So this was actually a great agent that was approved in 2012 that was working on serotonin uh, uh, 5-HT2C receptors. Unfortunately, um, this was a drug that I felt also was a mild agent, really had didn't have a lot of side effects, was really well tolerated. Um, however, um, in a study that was just published earlier this year, Camellia Timai, they were looking at long-term cardiovascular outcomes. And that was, this is actually something that they're trying to do a lot of these drugs. Um, and they found that inadvertently, they found increased risk of malignancy. Um, this was 7.7% in the intervention group versus the control group, 7.1%. Um, so due to that, um, which the risk of malignancy was in patients uh, developing colon cancer, breast cancer was more solid tumor. Um, because of that, they decided to pull it off the market. So um, it has been not on the market since February, but again, um, this was a decent agent, but definitely not using it anymore um, because of that risk. Um, lastly, I'll mention Sexenda. Sexenda was approved in 2015. Um, many of you guys are familiar with it. It's a GLP-1 that's taken daily. So this is an injection, comes in a pen. We start at 0 0.6 um, milligrams and we titrate up. So every week patients are going from 0 0.6, 1.2, 1.8, 2.4, then to three milligrams every day. So over a month, they are titrating up to the max dose. Um, and Weight loss on average, again, 5% or so at 56 weeks, which is, which is decent compared to some of the other drugs. Um, however, we do know that the most common side effects with Sexenda include nausea, vomiting, um, severe GI effects. And um, particularly, I've had patients who have decided to up-titrate on their own, and they go right up to three on their own and have had very bad effects. Or one patient in particular went, up to, went to the ER because she was having such severe nausea and vomiting. And so this is, well, uh, well known and this is something we want to counsel our patients on. Um, one other limitation on Sexenda is again cost. So out of pocket, $1,000 per month with a coupon card about $800 a month. So in certain patient populations, I'm not able to use Sexenda. Um, in those patients, especially, I try to push Sexenda in patients who have any form of dysglycemia or prediabetes. Uh, or diabetes risk. Um, and I also push in patients who um, have other complications such as psychiatric diagnoses or other things that limit the use of other options and have found it to be quite effective. So really the limiting factor is my, uh, the cost. Um, this was a study from 2015 from Pisenior et al um, showing the, the benefits. So again, over 56 weeks, we lost about eight to 10%, which is significant. Um, and over, you know, that time span, almost 14.4% lost more than 50%. So, you know, that is significant, this, um, this value um, that people are responding quite well to Sexenda, which is why I would consider Sexenda one of our more therapeutic or more 
pot uh, uh, more stronger agents compared to the others. Um, the other single agent I want to mention is uh, Plenity. Plenity was just approved in 2019 for patients with BMI over 25. It is not yet hit the, um, the drug stores. It's going to hit the market really in 2021. Um, but uh, I'm on an early prescriber list and I'm learning more about this. Um, it has a very unique mechanism in that it's a hydrocellulose gel capsule you take with water 20, 30 minutes before you eat, lunch and dinner. It then expands, and I've sort of taken a picture from the website, into a gel-like matrix in your stomach, uh, again, taking up space so you can't eat as much. And then it is moved towards the large intestine and cleared out as you move your bowels. So again, it's a hydrocellulose gel, uh, basically a fiber supplement. It is safe. It's well tolerated. Um, adverse effects include flatulence, distension, diarrhea. Um, and what's interesting is compared to the other agents which are approved for BMI over 30 or 27 with complications, this particular agent, they've marketed it as a drug device. So it's not actually a drug, it's marketed as a device and the threshold BMI is over 25. So this could potentially target a larger audience in terms of our population um, and the effects uh, seem quite good. Um, and this is actually the GLOW study. This was published in 2019, um, looking at weight loss over 24 weeks. Um, so again, over 24 weeks, approximately um, the weight change was around 6 to 7 percent compared to 4 percent in placebo. And you'll see on average that's what's seen in most of these drug trials is an average weight loss between 5 and 10 percent. What I also find very significant is, again, looking at weight loss trajectory, um, almost 60% of patients lost more than 5% of their body weight at 24 weeks, which is very significant. Um, and then almost 40% lost more than 7.5%. And almost 30% lost more than 10%. So again, a very uh, potentially effective option to consider uh, when it's available to all of us. Um, then just to jump to our combination drugs, we've got Qsimia and Contrave. So Qsimia was first approved in 2012, um, working on norepinephrine and GABA, comes in four doses. You typically start the lowest dose, which has 3.75 milligrams of fentramine. This is much different than fenfen, which was much higher doses of fentramine. Um, after two weeks, if patients are doing okay, you then titrate up. Ultimately, um, over a span of three to six months, you can titrate up to a maximum dose of fentramine of 15 milligrams daily. Um, and it's combined with topiramate extended release. Um, so you're moving from a dose of 23 milligrams of topiramate to 92 milligrams of topiramate. This is not the same as drug uh, doses that are used for this in the setting of migraine or neuropathic pain. So I do counsel patients that the side effects are gonna be less if they're worried about them. Um, but again, the titration is based on what the patient wants. And I sort of, rather than specifically following the scale, I go with what a patient wants. So if they're feeling good on a low dose, I will keep them there for as long as they need to be until they're reaching their goal weight. Um, in terms of adverse effects, so again, as a stimulant, Qsimia can potentially cause palpitations, feeling tremulous, jittery insomnia. The use of topiramate can contribute very rarely to uh, paresthesias. Um, I've even seen word finding difficulties at high doses. So these are some things that I do uh, potentially tell patients and have to warn them about, but in general, I found it very well tolerated. Um, and again, patients with uncontrolled high blood pressure cluster, I'm sorry, heart disease, um, I'm not using the Qsimia. Um, this is just a study from uh, SQL. This was done over um, one to two years showing the effect of mean weight loss. So as you can see, those who were maximized on the maximum dose of fentramine topiramate had approximately um, 10 to 12% mean weight loss. Um, last but not least, Contrave, first approved in 2014. Um, in terms of mechanism, we, we think it's synergistically working at the hypothalamus versus via POMC neurons. Um, and it's an interesting combination. Patients always ask me, what is it about bupropion that helps weight loss? We know that bupropion of all the other SSRIs, it can be somewhat stimulating. Can someone help with weight loss? Um, we don't really know yet how much the naltrexone or what the naltrexone is doing other than, again, working on appetite centers in the level of the brain. Um, in terms of side effects, the most common side effect I've seen is dry mouth, um, nausea, um, severe, I mean, restriction appetite um, is what I've seen. Um, and I've really found this helpful in patients who have binge eating issues or they have disordered eating patterns or concurrent mood issues. So if they really have some depression, want a little bit of a boost, and they're having trouble with stress eating, this could be a good agent for them. 
Um, and this is just doing uh, the um, long-term phase three study at 56 weeks. Um, patients lost approximately 9.3% of their body weight. What I will say about Contrate is that in this study, 41% of patients did not respond to the drug, uh, which is why this is a uh, this is looking at the responders or the completers. Um, but I will mention to you that because of that, I found clinically a lot of patients take the contrary and they feel absolutely nothing. Um, and of other people who have responded quite well. So there has been some diversity in the response to contrave. Um, I know that was sort of like a whirlwind. Um, ultimately, we don't have a good head-to-head, -head, we have no head-to-head -head comparison trials, but I think this actual meta-analysis does really well describe how these drugs sort of fit. So on the x-axis, we have the probability of achieving weight loss, significant weight loss. And on the y-axis, we have the probability of having fewer adverse effects. And so what I found in my clinical work is that, excuse me, uh, sexunda and Qsimia have been the most effective in terms of clinical outcomes and weight loss. But we've also found that they have the most significant effects in terms of adverse effects. So that is why, you know, a drug like Orlistat or Belvic, these were probably not as effective, but they were also very mild in terms of their side effect profile. So again, the way, sort of a nice way to picturally represent, and Plenity is not on here, obviously, because Plenity just got approved in the last six to 12 months. Um, some of the challenges, what I found in pharmacotherapy is that, you know, we start an agent um, and there's a lot of counseling. So we have to tell patients, yes, this is to be used in conjunction with diet lifestyle modification. Yes, you know, we will be monitoring your progress and eventually you'll be able hopefully to get off of this drug, but it could take up to 12 months. And so none of this is short term. Um, it's not gonna be a three month stint. It's gonna be at least six to 12 months with close monitoring, close follow-up. Um, ultimately we will wean therapy when patients are close to achieving their goal weight or obviously if they have adverse effects. Um, and then the other question is side effects. Patients are concerned about side effects. And so one of the things I always tell them is, yes, we would first lower the dose and then we would potentially switch you to something else if you're having an adverse side effect. Um, lastly, the question of cost. So as I mentioned, Sextenda is quite expensive. Um, we also know that you know, Medicare and Medicaid are not covering some of these drugs. And uh, if they don't have coverage for weight loss benefits, I am using generics. So for example, for Qsimia, I have been splitting the Qsimia into fentramine and topiramate. So what I do is I give the fentramine 15 milligrams in the morning. I give the topiramate 25 milligrams, which is an immediate release generic pill. I give that at bedtime. Um, and so this mimics actually a, a low dose of Qsimia. Um, what I've also done with my virtual patients is sometimes I don't feel like comfortable giving them a stimulant without meeting them face to face. So I counsel them that they need to have a blood pressure check within a week. Um, they need to have labs done. And sometimes I'm also using the eight milligram tablet because I know that I don't want to have an adverse effect and I don't feel that comfortable starting them on a higher dose without seeing them in person in the office. Um, the other drug that I do mimic is Contrave. So I've used Propropion on its own, either the Excel version or the immediate release, 100 to 400 milligrams in single tablets. And then I have the naltrexone. So naltrexone comes in a 50 milligram tablet and I've used up to a quarter to a half um, tablet every day. And so these are ways that I've tried to mimic using generics in terms of helping patients lose weight, even if they have Medicare, or Medicaid, or if they are not able to cover these drugs. Um, we know that these are, you know, potential um, drugs that can be used for studying patients with bariatric surgery. Um, just recently, there was a paper published for helping patients lose weight BMI over 50 using Qsimia. So uh, we definitely want more data uh, using these drugs for patients who need to lose weight before surgery um, and also post-surgery when there's risk of regain. Um, we're also, there are ongoing studies in the NAFL population, uh, which I'll be involved in as well. Um, and the other thing to mention just with a lot of these drugs is we want long-term cardiovascular data. Um, unfortunately, in Belvic, they were trying to get long-term cardiovascular data and then ultimately had this adverse you know, outcome in terms of seeing malignancy. So that would have been actually one of the first studies to really show potential cardiovascular benefit if it was present. So that is definitely something that they're pushing for uh, with these pharmacotherapeutic agents. And last not, but not least, not to mention when patients either fail pharmacotherapy or they're not candidates or they aren't covered, we then consider surgery. Um, we know that patients with BMI over 40 or BMI over 35 with comorbidities can qualify for endoscopic, uh, excuse me, for sleep, gastric sleeve or for uh, root and Y. We're not doing a lap band as much as, anymore. 
Um, but what I'm also doing is referring patients for um, bariatric endoscopy. So um, we do have a physician on the Upper East Side, Dr. Nikhil Kumta, who does bariatric endoscopy. And we have the single balloon. Um, the dual balloon is no longer on the market, but we also have endoscopic sutured gastroplasty. Um, and we know that the weight loss benefits are sort of moderate. So these are really for patients who have BMI 30 to 40, could benefit from a little bit of weight loss. Um, and it's almost potentially can be seen as sort of a bridge or uh, a mimic for bariatric surgery. So again, something to consider uh, for patients who are really looking for weight loss, but also either may not be interested in a surgery or um, may not qualify um, and who want to lose the weight. Um, the only caveat is that Bariatric endoscopy is not covered by insurance. So at the moment, it, it is a significant cost out of pocket, about $10,000 um, to start. But the hope is that the FDA, um, or at least insurance companies, will start covering this in the next few years. Um, and this is just a study, again, showing the benefits. We know that Stampede trial looked at metabolic surgery versus intensive medical therapy in patients with type 2 diabetes. And what I really emphasize with my patients is that when they're frustrated, they're having trouble with their diabetes control, and we have maximizing them on as many pharmacotherapeutic, excuse me, pharmacotherapeutic agents as we can, the idea that, yes, bariatric surgery can be a treatment in terms of not only helping them with weight loss, but also helping reduce their need for insulin. And what this study showed was at 60 months, you know, significant amount of patients were off all meds um, at 60 months who had gastric bypass or gastric sleeve. And that's something to really emphasize with patients um, because it is a large pill burden, large uh, insulin burden for a lot of them. Um, so just to jump to sort of what we're doing. So um, I am helping patients with weight loss on the Upper East Side. I know I have colleagues at Sinai West, Uptown and Downtown. Uh, we are all, you know, looking at patients, helping them achieve their, uh, weight loss goals. Um, and one of the benefits, or I would say one of the unique assets that Mount Sinai has is that we use basal metabolism testing. So we have the review indirect calorimeter um, at our uptown location uh, where we can measure a patient's basal metabolic rate. It takes about 15 minutes, they're coming in an empty stomach, um, and they're getting a printout at the end of the day showing how many calories they're able to burn at rest, how many calories they would need to target uh, to help them lose weight. So what sort of deficit is required? Uh, we're also using the Mount Sinai Physio Lab, which is a huge resource um, uh, on Sinai Uptown, uh, I should say Morning Sign, Mount Sinai um, on 114th in Amsterdam, where they are offering not only basal metabolism testing, but they have a metabolic chamber where you can go for 24 hours um, and very, very specifically calculate your basal metabolic rate. Um, they also have exercise testing. So we can calculate what's called a, a fat, there's a fat max profile, a VO2 max profile to really help patients figure out what is their optimal exercise to burn fat and to burn calories. Um, they also offer body composition testing as well as other forms of, of sort of nutrition and exercise sort of counseling. So again, a huge resource for all of us in Mount Sinai and something we really need to take advantage of. Um, so uh, jumping back to our patients, this was our patient who came to me for type 2 diabetes, was very frustrated, you know, the pandemic he was trying and really having a hard time. And so, you know, ultimately the question here, you know, in terms of the options, so one, A, starting exercise program. Yes, we did a lot of counseling on how to incorporate exercise, incorporate toning exercises and really get him, you know, not necessarily going to the gym, but getting some weight weightlifting or something like that incorporated into his weekly schedule. Um, B, switching from true list to Ozempic. So yes, I, I, I did think there might be some utility. Maybe weekly Ozempic could help a little bit with weight loss and the setting of type two diabetes. So yes, that could be a consideration here. C, uh, referring to bariatric surgery. So this was something that we extensively discussed um, and really, again, looking at the data like from Stampede, yes, there is long-term benefit, potential remission of diabetes, Diabetes, so really something to counsel patients on extensively. So C was probably the, the most important thing I did. And then D, um, I do not typically add sulfonylureas to improve perineal glucose control unless they're, you know, not on insulin. It's really the only option we have. But, you know, ultimately my goal is to really use pharmacotherapeutic agents that are going to help them with weight loss. Um, so again, looking at these answers and sort of there are many ways to approach this, but my hope is that with sort of what we discussed, you can sort of think about how to approach diabetes and just patients generally um, looking at sort of how we can improve their diet, their lifestyle changes, um, and, and if we need to use pharmacotherapy. Um, 
And one thing to mention, you know, just talking a little bit more about bariatric surgery and diabetes remission, we know that, you know, patients age, their duration, their diabetes control, and also if they're on insulin, all of these um, make a difference in terms of their chance of remission. So again, something that was discussed. Um, so just to summarize, um, again, I know I went very quickly, um, but you know, there is so much to talk about with obesity. We know that it starts with general screening. We start with diet lifestyle modification, again, triaging patients based on not only their BMI, but also their complications and looking at more of a complication centric framework. Um, and then triaging whether they need diet lifestyle modification, whether they need medical therapy or whether they should really be discussing bariatric surgery based on the degree of complications and their severity and how they're doing. Um, so in summary, uh, we now consider obesity a chronic disease. We should be considering this term, you know, ABC, adiposity-based chronic disease, taking away the stigma. Um, and really, we should be screening early, looking at BMI, looking at waist circumference, looking at the complications, um, starting with lifestyle modification. And really, you know, we need more research looking at long-term consequences of these pharmacotherapeutic agents and, you know, how do we triage patients towards helping them achieve their goals. Um, and so with that, I will end um, and I'll leave some time for questions. Okay. Well, thank Thanks you so much. So much. That was a great uh, whirlwind tour. <laughs> and I'm sure people have lots of questions. I'll ask people either to unmute themselves or to enter them in the chat box. And maybe I'll start out by just asking you to tell me a little more about Noom. I've tried to look on their website, but you know they don't really give you any information until you enter all kinds of demographics about yourself. Yeah, and yeah. I will say that's address. and I, my patients seem to really like it, but I don't I don't know a lot about it. It's it's very behavioral driven, so it gives them it's almost like a red light green light types of approach. So they get a meal and they are. It's, um, they're having sort of like this diet coach that's sort of looking over their shoulder and saying, okay, let's focus more on vegetables or, you know, let's focus on avoiding these types of foods. So it's, it's more looking at behavioral cues. Um, I myself agree it's, it's very secretive in terms of their approach, but their, their data actually looks quite good. And, and at least short term, I've found patients do respond to it. Some patients have said it's a little bit basic, but it's nice to have like someone there. And, and that's what a lot of patients will tell you is they like that sort of supervision type aspect. Great, thanks. What other questions? Dr. Merrill. Hi, um, I'm Eve Merrill, one of the hospitalists. Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. I guess my major question was, um, you know, I only see patients in the hospital and obesity is not something we're able to kind of focus on when we want to treat an acute problem and focus on discharge. What recommendations would you have for the hospitalist or inpatient medicine to get um, patients either better plugged in or referred um, to you or kind of outpatient services? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It's a challenging point is in the hospital, you're obviously focused on that acute issue, that acute uh, illness or, or injury. Um, I think obviously getting, you know, making sure you have a weight, looking at, you know, metabolic complications and, and making sure if that's impacting the acute in, insult or whatever is going on inpatient. But I agree with you, it, it ultimately should be done more from the primary care's perspective or, or the outpatient setting. So yes, if this is someone who has uncontrolled diabetes, whose blood sugars have been hard to, to manage, you know, in the hospital, they should be set up with someone. If you notice they have morbid obesity, yes, um, suggesting a follow-up that definitely we would, we would appreciate. And, and I just add to that, like, obviously all of our primary care docs are, uh, are doing these things. And then we do have a weight loss program here, uh, Stephanie Berenger and Dan Donovan lead that. So certainly people who need an endocrinologist point of view can be seen here in Union yep. Square. Exactly. What other questions do people have? Great, I guess you answered everything. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us and uh, and we'll get to see you again, I hope. Yeah, and definitely if you have questions, obviously you're free to email me, even referrals. Um, you know, with virtual visits, we're doing a lot. <laughs> Virtually, we're expanding our, our bases, so happy to help out in any way. And I know Dr. Berenger Macera and, and, and Dr. Donovan also are, are wonderful. So we definitely want to just increase awareness. <laughs> Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. Take care.